But the first thing to understand is what is the last judgment? What is going on in this image? And so this is the first image that we know of, of the last judgment. This is a sixth century uh, image from Ravenna. And so now we have Christ in the center and he is, has his hand out. He is pointing to the sheep and on his left hand, you have the goats. And so that is where the whole idea of the last judgment comes from, is Christ saying on that day, on that final day, I will say to the sheep, come, enter into my kingdom, and I will say to the goats, leave away, far away from me. Right? And so that's the way to understand the basic idea of what the last judgment is. It's there are some things which are brought inside the sheep, and there are some things that are excluded, which are the goats. And so on the right hand of Christ, on his right hand, you have the sheep, and on his left hand, that's what it said in the text. It says he'll say to the sheep on his right, enter to the goats on his left, go away. Obviously, it's not the kind of thinking that we like to have today. But what I'd like to propose to you is that that is actually how all identity formation works. That is, anything that exists is necessarily a judge. Anything that has identity, right? Anything, I mean, anything, like a cup, a, a pencil, a, a baseball uh, club, like anything that, that has identity is necessarily a judge because, because it is a specific identity, it necessarily has two things. It has an inside and it has an outside. It has things that belong to it and has things that don't belong to it. And there's sometimes a, there's a hierarchy of that type of participation. It's always often not necessarily a, a, a clear demarcation, but there is a type of hierarchy of participation in something, uh, and then there is an outside. And so all things that have identity necessarily function as judges. And that's why in the ancient world, you know, for example, a, a very, a saint that I love very much, Saint Maximus the Confessor, he talks about the divine logos, like, in the gospel, but he says all things have a logos, right? All things that exist have a name, a reason, a purpose, and actually all of those are the same. Right? The name of something, the reason, the purpose for it, it's the reason why you see it in the first place. Why do I identify something as having identity, as having being, is because I can see its purpose, even if it's unconscious, it doesn't have to be conscious, right? It's like if I know that if I have a name for something, it's because there's a reason why there's a name for it. I, I know what a bottle is because I drink water out of it. And it's a judge because, and I participate in that judgment because I don't want to get wet. It is, so if there's a hole in the bottle, it's a bad water bottle. And I will exclude it from, it, from its participation in the identity of bottle, right? And so this is just how things work. And you just can't avoid it. Like it just, this is just, how reality functions, whether it's your family, whether it's the school, all of these things all have this structure. And the last judgment, the way to understand it is it's the, it's the most extreme version of that. It's the one that takes it to the very limit of what you can almost tolerate in terms of understanding what identity formation is. Think of it like it's a cosmic version of every time I recognize something as having identity but it's this massive, massive version of it. So what do we have in the image? We have Christ in glory at the center of the image. This is the son of man, right? This is the prophetic image of the perfect man. So if you're not a Christian, in some ways it doesn't totally matter for this conversation. Just think of it like it's the ideal person, right? Yeah, as Christians, we believe that that's this person, but just as a structure, think of it like it's the ideal of a person. It's the, it's the human, the highest human that you can imagine, the one that contains all that it was his human in it, and that is basically the source of why we know that there's humanity, and it's the culmination of all that is good about what human is, okay? And that's here, and that's the judge. And why is it the judge? Because that is it, right? That's how we understand the good. It's like if we know what a good person is, then we inevitably know what aligns with it, what comes towards it, and what is moving away from it, right? You can think about it in a, in a, 
a sports team is always the easiest one because it's amoral, so it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't rub people wrong. Uh, you know, you, you know what a good player, a good basketball player is, and that good basketball player becomes a standard by which we measure other basketball players. It just happens. And if you have one that rises up really high, then that standard gets higher, and all of a sudden the judgment becomes stronger. Right? If I go to a, a basketball game for kids that are 13, 14, or if I go to a professional basketball game, I do not judge the same way because the standard of the participation is not the same. If I go to a professional game, those, the standards have been, have been lifted so high that I'm like, well, that's not Michael Jordan. Right? Eh. You know, it's always, there's always this, this judging. And this is something that, that, that happens inevitably. So imagine, so this is the, the perfect man who is there, and now he is signifying that he is judging the world. He is showing the right hand and the left hand. And he is saying to those on the right, come in, and to those on the left, move away. Those that don't fit with the ideal or aren't moving towards the ideal are pushed out, and those that fit with the ideal or are moving towards the ideal are gathered in. So the structure of the image this image of the heavenly man, and that's how to understand it, right? It's like, why is it a heavenly man? It's because he's the ideal. He's just higher than us. And it's a, it's a metaphor, but it's not. In, in, and that's how we think of things that are above us, that are more than us, that are higher than us. And so they appear in heaven. They come down from above. And that's how we recognize that they are the model by which we measure other things. And it's a very practical thing. There's nothing, uh, it's not magical in any way. You know, if I am here and I'm in front of you and I'm above you right now, then I am the one who gives the standard of what is happening now, right? I am the measure of this event at this moment. And that's how, that's just how it works. If you have someone who rises above, even physically above everybody else, then everybody can see him, but not all of you can see each other. And so I can judge all of you, right? But you can't all judge each other. You can judge me in this case though. It's a little different. <laughs> um, but just to understand that this idea of the heavenly man, right? 